Good morning. You may now take off your face mask if you'd like to do so. And as a reminder, uh, please uh, keep it handy in case there's an emergency and you need to get up. And we do ask for you to stay seated throughout the whole service unless you absolutely have to get up. And then if you do, please put your face mask on and fully cover your nose and mouth. And Stand and give the people around you that you might pass on the way out a chance to put their masks on as well. And now, welcome to our worship service. It's so good to see everybody this morning. I'm Alan Akana, the Kahu or pastor of the church, and I welcome you. And if there are any visitors that are here for the first time, please make sure you get a visitor's uh, gift and a little packet from one of the deacons in the back. And uh, let's see here. There are just a few things that I like to point out during the pandemic. One is um, not only do we ask for you to stay seated during the entire service, uh, but, but also um, our offering um, is done up here or in the back. We've got a couple baskets, and we don't actually take time for the offering during the service during the pandemic because we don't want people touching the same thing. And so if you'd like to give, you can give that way or online, and we appreciate all the gifts that people have been giving during the pandemic. We do have our temporary worship guidelines. Um, we have our temp, did, did this go on? Okay, we have our, is it working again? Okay, we have our temporary worship guidelines on the top of page five. And um, also I wanted to point out, um, just highlight one announcement on page six, and that is one great hour of sharing. This is really our big special offering we do every spring, right around, right before Easter, in fact. And so on Palm Sunday, which is the 28th of this month, and Easter Sunday, which is the 4th of April, we will collect one great hour of sharing. And this is the denomina denominational offering that goes towards supporting people who have experienced natural disasters like floods. Um, also, um, immigrant and refugee ministry in this past year especially has seen great need throughout the world. And this is one way that all the churches in our denomination pull together and many other denominations as well. 
And through that one great hour of sharing offering, we basically come up with literally millions of dollars that churches collect that help people that are in some of the greatest need today. So I encourage you to start thinking about what you might offer to one great hour of sharing. And you've got a couple of weeks, like I said, two weeks from today, we'll collect that offering and then also on Easter Sunday. Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent, and uh, those of you that have been with us during Lent know that we have been focusing on the signs of God in the lectionary, the scriptures that we have from our denomination. And I was just reflecting um, this morning as I woke up. A, a few weeks ago, we talked about the sign of the rainbow. Um, which was a reminder that God would never destroy the entire earth with a flood. And I thought about that a lot on Friday because it seemed like at one point God might be forgetting that. But it was, it was uh, certainly a trying time for many people. And I know um, some of our neighbors had uh, property damage and homes were damaged. And once we know what some of the needs are uh, in the community, we'll be sure as a church to help with that as well. Um, but today, I would like for us to focus on the sign of the cross, which really is the sign of Christ's presence among us, because as you know, the cross wasn't the final word. After the cross came the resurrection. And today, we'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. And in the reading, the Pharisee Nicodemus approached Jesus and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God because no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And so I invite you as we begin our worship service today to think about a sign that has been particularly meaningful to you lately that simply reminds you of the presence of God. I want you to know that this morning when I woke up and was opening up doors and windows, I looked out this direction right after the sun came up, and there was a, a complete rainbow covering our church, and I, I couldn't get a good picture of it, I, otherwise I would have done that, but that was just a sign for me as a reminder of God's presence. So as we begin our worship today, consider God's presence and the signs that God has given to you to remind you of God's presence. Today's call to worship is adapted from Psalm 107. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, and the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. The Lord gathers all who are troubled from throughout the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Have the storms gotten under your skin? Are you wandering in the desert and lost on your way? Are you hungry and thirsty in body or in spirit? Is your soul fainting within you? Do you sit in the darkness of loneliness and sadness? Is your heart heavy and no one seems to care? Do you feel trapped behind the invisible bars that are stronger than iron? Then call out to the Lord with your troubles, for the Lord delivers us from them all. The Lord leads us and shows us the way where we find open arms of welcome. The Lord calms the storms that batter our souls. Let us thank the Lord, for the Lord offers steadfast love and shows wonders to all who call upon the Lord. Let us offer to the Lord our sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing of the grace of God with songs of joy. Let us be glad because the Lord brings peace and multiplies our blessings. Thank you, God that we are getting through the storm of this past week, this past month, how long has it been? And through the storms, the many storms of this year and of last year, all kinds of storms. These are challenging times. Thank goodness your steadfast love indeed 
endures forever. Help us and stay with us. Amen. The Old Testament. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Numbers, chapters 21, verses 4 to 9. Listen for the word of, the lo of God. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that the many Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Today's New Testament reading is from Ephesians Chapter 2, verses 1 and 4 to 10. Listen for the word of God. You were dead through trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not the result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Today's gospel reading is from John chapter 3, verses 13 to 21. As we hear these words from Jesus, May we listen for the word of God. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent to the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God that did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. May God Bless the reading of the word, and may our hearts be open to receiving it.
black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Everything is beautiful in its own way. Like a starry summer night or a snow-covered winter's day. shape and size are precious in his eyes. Jesus loves the little children of the The story of this morning's reading from the book of Numbers is truly one of the most bizarre stories in the Old Testament with God sending poisonous serpents to punish people for their horrible sin of complaining. So, as I was reading this past week from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, we see this strange story unfolding where the people of Israel have just left Egypt on their way to the Promised Land. The book of Numbers is actually another Exodus story, like the book of Exodus. It's just that the book of Numbers takes place one year, one month, and one day after they've actually left Egypt. We know that because that's how the book of Numbers starts out. And it begins with a census, something much like what our country went through this last year. And in the book of Numbers, beginning with a census or numbering of people, we come up with the name, the book of Numbers. That's why it's called that. So we have this book where people are gathering together and Moses says, God wants me to make sure that we count all of you. And so he goes through each of the 12 tribes of Israel and comes up with a number for each one of them. And the number is well over 600,000. Now, you might think that's a lot of people. However, that was only the males who were at least... 20 years of age or older than 20 years of age who were able to fight as warriors. And it didn't count the priests, and there is 22,000 of them. So if you think about it, and you count all of the women, all of the children, all of the teenagers, all of the older men or infirmed or injured men who couldn't fight, and all the priests. We're talking millions of people marching through the wilderness of Sinai. About three weeks after the book starts, after they've already been on their journey for well over a year, we're told that the people left the wilderness of Sinai and started heading for the promised land. And one of the first things that they do is they complain. And this is an actual pattern that we see over and over again in the book of Numbers. The people complain. 
And, and the pattern actually goes like this. God blesses the people and guides the people through the leadership of Moses and bestows gifts upon the people. And then the people find something to complain about. There's not enough food. Well, there obviously is because they're all alive and God's providing manna for them. There's not enough water. Well, there actually was plenty of water, and when they got low, miracles happened so that they had plenty of water. Well, the food just doesn't taste good enough. It's not the same as the food we used to make back in Egypt. So the idea here is that the people of Israel found something to complain about throughout their whole journey, and they complained to Moses, and they started really getting on his nerves. All of those complaints were grating on Moses, and Moses complained to God as a result and said, God, why, why do I have to be in charge of all these complaining people? <sighs> so Moses is angry, but God apparently is even more angry. So in this pattern, God blesses the people, the people complain, God punishes the people, often with very severe punishment. And then the people finally say, you know, we're getting kind of tired of being punished and we know it's all because we complain. So we're going to stop complaining and basically repent and start acting like grateful people because God is a graceful God. And then God forgives the people and then the pattern starts all over again. They walk a few more steps and find something else to complain about. Well, in today's lesson that we just read, God punishes the people for complaining about not having enough food, not having enough to drink, and boy, is this food bland compared to what we're used to back in Egypt. And the severe punishment this time is that God sends these poisonous serpents to bite all the people and kill them. Now, that does seem rather extreme, of course, and the people feel that, and so they go to Moses and say, help us, you know, pray to God on our behalf, and so Moses prays, and God says, basically, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you, Moses, and for all the complaining children I have out there, I'm going to have you build this gigantic bronze serpent that looks just like the serpents that are biting and killing all the people. And I want you to put it on this very high pole, so high that all these millions of people can see it. And anytime they get bit by one of these poisonous serpents, all they have to do is look at that pole up in the sky and they'll be healed. They won't die. They can go back to life as normal. So anyway, Moses does exactly what God asks, and he creates this huge bronze serpent out of bronze and sticks it on this pole and tells the people, if you get bit, just look at it. And every single person, apparently, that got bit, that looked at the pole, didn't die. But the people who didn't look at the pole, the serpent upon it, they did die. So this definitely seems like an outrageous silly story, like a fairy tale, right? Something that you might tell your children. And I can almost hear this Jewish mother saying, now Joshua, stop your complaining. You know what happened to the people out in the desert when they complained. And this was a story that every children heard probably every time they complained. And when they grew up, they, I'm sure, taught it, to, uh, shared this story with their own children. What I find really surprising is Jesus actually refers to this story in John chapter 3. It just seems like so bizarre that Jesus would go back there, find this story from their tradition, and share it as he's talking about God's love. Well, let me just give you a little bit of background in terms of what's going on in the early chapters of John so we get a sense of why this is happening and what it might mean. So last week I shared with everybody that the Gospel of John talks a lot about the signs of Jesus. In fact, that word sign comes up over and over again, not miracle, but sign. And a sign is anything that points to God. 
And Jesus, of course, is the critical sign, the most important sign, the main sign in John. But in John chapter 2, we know that Jesus performed his first sign, at least according to John's gospel, and that was the changing of water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And what we know about that is that people believed in Jesus because they saw the sign. And what we see in the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 2 and throughout the Gospel, is that the signs pointed to something greater. The signs pointed to Jesus representing God. And the sign at the wedding of Cana basically was a sign that Jesus was here representing God with his words and his actions. And then we find out later in John chapter 2 that Jesus left Cana, actually went from Cana to Capernaum, and then went all the way down, probably a four or five day journey to Jerusalem, and saw that all these people in the temple were trying to make money while they were there and selling cattle and selling sheep and selling doves, and Jesus got upset and chased them all out and tipped over the money changer's table and all that. And then it says right after that, and Jesus performed many signs while he was there, and the people believed in him because of those signs. We don't know really at all what those signs were. John doesn't tell us at that point. But if all the rest of the signs in John's gospel are any indication, then Jesus was most likely giving sight to the blind and feeding the hungry and healing those people who were sick and injured and the like. And so we have Nicodemus all of a sudden showing up at night where no one else can see him. And Nicodemus approaches Jesus and says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God because no one can do these signs that you do apart from God. They can only do these signs with God's presence. And then Jesus responds, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he or she is born again or born from above, depending on how you translate that word. And at first, it seems like Jesus is changing the subject because Nicodemus has, wants to talk about signs, and all of a sudden, Jesus apparently changes the subject and talks about the kingdom of God and being born again. How bizarre for Jesus to go and change the topic like that. But actually, what Jesus was doing in his response was getting to the heart of the matter, what was really on Nicodemus' mind and had everything to do with what Nicodemus brought up. Because all of those signs, what Nicodemus was talking about, all point to the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus came and was a sign himself, and also performed many signs so that people through Jesus would look to the kingdom of God, which is an altogether way, different way of being in the world than the kingdom that they knew, also translated empire, which meant the Roman Empire. So you've heard me say this probably a thousand times already, but it's this pattern that we see throughout all the Gospels Whenever Jesus talks about kingdom or empire, he's always saying that in a sense that you've got the Roman Empire, it's all wrong. Their priorities are wrong. The values are wrong. Culture just doesn't, it's not about love. And so if you look at Nicodemus and who he was as a person, we know that he was one of the people who benefited extremely well from all the privilege that he had in life and the wealth and the political power. He was one of the elite. As a Pharisee, 
he got to make the decisions in terms of who made money, who kept money, who made more money, who got to do what in terms of the temple and not just religion, but politically as well. But Nicodemus, when he saw Jesus, he knew that there was something special going on here, that these signs that Jesus was performing were somehow captivating for him. But, but he knew that he couldn't be open about it and just show up in the middle of day where everybody can see him because to be a Pharisee meant that you kind of had to keep the status quo. If you started paying attention publicly and affirming publicly anybody that said anything different than the emperor, you stood to lose everything, all of your privileges, all of your wealth, all of your power. So Nicodemus shows up to Jesus at night under the cover of darkness and wants to know more about these signs. And so Jesus is basically saying, you know, Nicodemus, if you want to know what all these signs are about, you have to be born again. In other words, you've got to be willing to start all over. You've got to be willing to give up all your privilege, all your wealth, all your power. You've got to be willing to step back and say, how can I allow God to transform me as a person so that I can be a part of this grand vision that God has for the world where everybody counts, everybody matters, everybody's loved by God. And we know that Nicodemus struggled with that. That was a hard concept for him. And he said, well, how can somebody be born after they've already been born and grown up? How can a man enter his mother's womb again? This doesn't make sense, Jesus. And I think what Nicodemus was really struggling with was knowing that if he was going to follow Jesus, he would have to be willing to start over, literally be born again in a brand new way. He would have to allow God to transform him and his values and all that he held dear. And that was a tough thing because... Like I said, he was one of the elite. Now, I, I do want to say a couple of good things about Pharisees because sometimes when we talk about Pharisees, we look at some of the things that they struggled with and we just create them all as bad. Now, Nicodemus was one of the good ones. He at least went to Jesus and talked to Jesus. He was there. He's mentioned a couple other times in John's gospel. He supported Jesus as much as he could with his position which was maybe okay with Jesus. But the idea here is not just for Nicodemus, but for everybody. Are you willing to give up what you have in order to love others? Now, it's interesting that when Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus, he says, just like the serpent was raised up in the wilderness, referring to the story that we just read from the book of Numbers, so also must the Son of Man be raised up so that you may have eternal life. It's interesting that Jesus, like I said, would go back there and, and, and talk about that. To be raised up is a euphemism back then in the, in the Greek language, in the, in the Roman culture. To be raised up was a euphemism for crucifixion. And crucifixion was the most brutal form of torture that the empire used against anybody that spoke against the empire. If you said anything about the emperor, you could be crucified. And people would use the euphemism did you hear so-and-so was raised up? Meaning, did you know that that person was crucified for speaking out against the emperor? And so by Jesus saying, using that word being raised up, he was basically saying, be willing to love in the same way 
that I love as the Son of Man and the Son of God. To be born again means not just focusing on yourself and seeing everything as how can I benefit and how can my immediate family benefit, but how can everybody in my society benefit? For Jesus' death on the cross was a symbol that he was willing to love that much. And he calls each of us who follow him, who say Jesus is my Lord, to be willing to love in that same way, to sacrifice. And of course, we read this morning, for God so loved the world that God gave God's only son in order that all who believe in him might have eternal life. The idea here is God's unconditional and eternal love for the entire world. And whether you are someone like Nicodemus or you're one of Jesus' fishermen disciples, the question is, are you willing to be born again? In other words, are you willing to be transformed by God's love? Are you willing to let it get so deep inside you that you're able to be differently in the world than what you have been being in the past? That idea of the serpent being raised up is, I think, an okay analogy. I don't like the idea of this serpent biting people and killing them. But I do want to tell you that the analogy breaks down at a certain point. You see, in the Old Testament days, in the book of Numbers, if you were bit by a serpent, all you had to do is look at the giant bronze serpent up on the pole, you'd be healed, and you could go back to life as normal. Just go back to doing whatever you were doing before. But what Jesus is really getting at in terms of being lifted up, in terms of loving sacrifice, is that that sacrifice that God did for you, that Jesus is asking for you to take part in, that changes everything about you. That is truly transformational. You cannot go back to life as normal. Just like being born again, you've got this little baby that sees everything differently once it's born. You've got a baby who is experiencing life in a totally different way and who is being a different person outside the womb. And Jesus is basically saying, that's what my love does to you. You become a different person. Now, there are people who have grown up in the church, who have always loved God and always made loving God and loving Jesus a priority. And sometimes some of us think, well, I don't need to be born again. That's for those sinners over there. That's for those people who really need to change. But the message for me today is, you know, it doesn't matter if the changes in your life need to be huge or very small. Transformation through love is possible for you right now. And that transformation is eternal. And that's why Jesus talks about eternal life. Once you've been changed by God's love in any way, that lasts forever. No one or nothing can take that away. I've heard many people use this passage in a really judgmental way. Many Christians, many preachers. You have to believe these certain things about Jesus or you go to hell. You don't get eternal life. And yet, when I read this passage, I just see so much love. In fact, the verse right after John 3, 16, if you read that, for I did not come to judge the world. Jesus came to love the world. Jesus came to offer love to every one of us, no matter who we are or what we've been through in life. 
And the irony of that judgment to me is that the Pharisees, Nicodemus, the Pharisees are known for being judgmental. They're known to be the ones that knew all the laws, the letter of the law. They, they knew everything in, that you're supposed to believe and claim to believe all those things. And they knew all the traditions and claimed to keep every single tradition. And yet Jesus said, that's not what it's all about. You can have all the right beliefs and do all the right traditions and still miss the whole point. You, Nicodemus, must be born again. The idea here is that if you're focused on just doing all the right things and believing all the right things and saying all the right things, and you live your life without love, without God's grace, you've missed the entire point of Jesus altogether. You have the opportunity right now to be born again in whatever way God is asking you to be transformed. You can actually experience God's love in your very core in such a way that God's love can transform you and make you whole in a way that lasts forever. That's eternal life. And although I know Jesus talked a little bit about going to heaven, most of what Jesus talked about is living right now that kind of abundant and eternal life while you're here on earth with this flesh that you have. And really, that's the message of John chapter 3 for all of us, no matter who we are, no matter what our struggles are. We can experience God's love and it can transform us. It can transform our communities. It can transform our nation. Indeed, it can transform the world. And I'll leave you with one of my favorite scriptures that Karin read for, for us from Ephesians chapter 2. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not that of your own doing not that of yourselves. It is a free gift of God. Thanks be to God for God's grace. Amen. It's now time for the sharing of joys and concerns. And it looks like Rosemary's got a couple of cards of joys and concerns. And as a reminder, on page seven, we have all of our prayers that I'm aware of that we pray for people during the week, and so please continue to pray for others. And um, healing prayers for Rebecca, is it Estes? And um, this is uh, Phyllis Megan's roommate that is experiencing some pretty significant um, health issues. And that's um, all we have for today in terms of joys and concerns, and so... I would invite you to take just an extra moment today to think about the blessings, the joys in your life, and lift up any concerns you have as well. And after a moment of silent prayer, I'll lead us in a verbal prayer. Let us pray together. O oh God, as we consider the blessings that you continue to heap upon us in your abundant grace, we give you thanks and offer our praise to you. And we thank you for all the signs that you send to us, the, the rainbows, the reminders that the cross of Christ is a symbol of life, way more than it is a symbol of death the symbols that we see on a regular basis in our world, 
as well as the symbols that we see and focus on here in church. Oh God, may we all be reminded of your presence, of your love, and may we be committed to sharing your loving presence with others in any way that we can. Oh God, for those who are lonely and struggling with life, those who experience depression, mental illness, sadness of all kinds, we pray, oh God, that your grace would be real. We pray for healing for all who are sad, for those who are lonely. God, we also pray for those who are ill, for their physical healing. We pray for those who care for them, that you would give them strength and peace and wisdom and energy. God, we also remember those who are serving people in this world all over. And even here on this island, those who are caring for those that have been so afflict, affected by the floods that we've had this past week. We pray for continued grace and wisdom. And we pray the same for all of our leaders here on this island, in our state, in our nation, and in all nations. Oh God, in this time where we have seen and experienced so much division, we pray for continued signs of people coming together, of laying aside differences, of forgiving one another, and finding commonalities in purpose and in relationships. Oh God, for this earth, we pray for healing. And we know that we have not done a superb job in caring for the earth. And we ask, oh God, that you would place upon our hearts ways where we can take better care, not only of this planet, but of her waters, her air, her trees, her creatures. And God, we lift up all today who are immigrants and refugees and people who have suffered from injustices and also from violence of all kinds and also of natural disasters. God, we pray for peace, we pray for safety, for strength, and for justice. And God, we also lift up those who have recently lost loved ones. Oh God, touch their hearts in your special way. Bring comfort, bring peace. We ask all these things in the name of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you so much for that beautiful song. What a lovely way to end today's service. I now invite everyone to take your face mask and place it securely over your nose and mouth and please keep it on until you're fully off the church property or back in your vehicle. And now I invite you to stand for the benediction. Let us go from this place anticipating the signs of God, for indeed God so loved the world. And now may the love of God, the grace of our faithful Savior Jesus Christ, and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.